Hello, my lovelies. I'm Ginny O, the author with no last name. And today, we're going to talk about the Star Stable Progress Report. On April 29th, Star Stable put out their now monthly blog post, and there isn't really any new, new stuff in it. There is some news to report, it just didn't turn up in this blog post. So we'll get to the news at the end. We have an update about the Equestrian Spring Festival, more about server refactoring, justifications for why they're taking out the Gen 1 and 1.5 horses, and as always, talk about the character update. <laughs> the one thing that really bothers me is the tone of these articles, especially the introductions. Like they have to tell us how great, awesome, and amazing they all are. I don't know why Ismail was left out of this. Maybe he has to be. If so, good for him. If it's great and amazing, or you as people are great and amazing, well, no. They don't have to tell us. It's patronizing and infantilizing the way they do this. Please, stop. The Equestrian Festival! They're reviewing it, so my thoughts! The colors were nice. The training XP was really generous. Some of the gear looked good. Some of the gear had some questionable design decisions. Most of it was really overpriced in the shop. I am not enthused by the $100 plus dollar payment hurdle for the new gear. That's lifetime. Plus buying a Gen 3 horse that can wear it. Plus uh, buying the tack itself. That's pretty steep for a game without any horse game mechanics. The festival grounds layout was really, really cluttered, especially in Moreland. And if they want to do anything like the Bloom Quests again, they need to rework the camera heavily and allow me to have better control over it. By this I mean I get to move the camera with the right click, and when I let the right click go, it stays where I put it instead of swinging back around to the buttocks of my horse. I don't care if you've got eight cameras on Sabine. If you can't give me a better camera so I can see what I'm doing with a dozen balloons hovering behind me, the game becomes frustrating, not fun. Because by no means imaginable should those quests have been remotely challenging. Half the quests felt really out of character for those specific characters. I'm talking Alex and Linda. And the other half of the quest with Sabine felt more nuanced and complex. Almost 60% of the player base sided with Sabine and released the piggies. I mean, why wouldn't you? Releasing the piggies was fun! I love the bouncy animations they have! Hell yes! I'm releasing the piggies! My point is here, the writing felt really inconsistent. Alex and Linda felt childish and completely unprepared, which isn't like either of them, and I wanted to roll my eyes. The whole get a disguise thing was just ridiculous and felt like filler, and it served absolutely no point in the story. Oh yes, instead of going to talk to people in Jorvik City or Jarlheim who sell disguises, we're going to gather randomly placed objects on the ground that have no reason to be there within 10 feet of us and of Sabine. It's lazy. I bet Sabine planted them and is laughing at us. While Sabine, in contrast, had a good point. I do like, with the second week of quests, our characters were given dialogue options to question Alex and Linda, who seem to forget, the only thing we know Sabine has done is facilitate the mind control slash kidnapping of Justin and vandalizing the Silver Glade riding arena. Or we can assume that since she and Jay or Jessica and Katya wore hoods, you know, the whole get a puppy questline most of us have forgotten about? We technically don't know as a player character that Sabine is the Red Rider. We don't know Jay or Jessica is the Black Rider, or Katya is the Gray Rider, and at least Chio is what color we don't know. 
Star Stable can't seem to figure out the difference between in-character knowledge and out-of-character knowledge, and this is making the story very weak and confusing. What the player character knows versus what the player knows because of meta and these blog posts are two different things, and they need to keep this in mind when they're writing these story quests to keep that mystery and intrigue and journey of discovery going. Whenever we've confronted the Dark Riders, they've had their hoods up and been wearing their Robin Hood-esque outfits. The only Dark Rider we may be know about, and this is out of character, not in character, is Sabine because Sabine helped with the whole Justin thing. She could have been duped along with us, but yeah, she knows our name because, you know, we have met her at the Silver Glade Equestrian Center where she had her characterization of, you are peasants and I am obsessed with show jumping. There was more hints Khan was a scary horse and part of the Dark Riders than Sabine. Here are Linda and Alex who can't seem to control their emotions for 20 seconds around this woman whose only real issue we can see as players in character is she, she is super hardcore about show jumping and competing. It was just really, really weak writing. Almost everything they gave us, if it had been ready the first week, could have been put it out the first week. They are having this issue lately as they are holding off on the good material until the end, leaving the beginning of their festivals to feel like, buy this grind fests. You want to open your story for your festival with something exciting and a bang. Do not leave your best material for last because people aren't going to care by that point. Do not have your game get good 100 hours into the festival. You need to have a good beginning and a good ending. Buy this stuff is not a good beginning nor a good ending. Really, the whole thing felt sparse and dragged out. It was 99% grind and 1% story. And I'm surprised they didn't put in the open house quests in the Galentine's group race just because they'd thrown in all three open house races and the open house let someone from another country tell us about your big history tour. Seriously, put Johanna up on a horse and have her do it. Luciana knowing this stuff is really weird. I will take Linda doing it, because that's in Linda's character. She's gone to high school in York, or secondary school, or whatever you want to call it. Looking at the festival roadmap before we got to the festival, it didn't really feel like they had anything. And coming out of it, it didn't feel like we really had anything because it was either all stuff we'd done before, the races, the herding, the flying flowers types of quests, or the stuff like Sabine's extra races didn't stick around. Um, the show jumping race she gave us wasn't set up properly. Give some more spaces between those jumps so the horse can recover. They were again frustrating due to bad setup and bad movement mechanics on the horse's part. One of these races was oriented backwards. It was just really confusing. If you have a little fence there, I don't care if it has a hitbox or not. When you're doing a race and the race is like, okay, now you have to go through the fence, it is confusing. I think it was a Salome racing where there is not supposed to be any jumping. It was just, did no one think of this? The other end had an opening in the fence. With the love of little green apples, just flip it around. The festival didn't feel like a celebration of equestrianism because the booth Linda and Alex set up was about druids and technology instead of, I don't know, show jumping like Linda is into. We didn't learn anything about the history of these events or the type of horses that are good at show jumping, and that might be because the only breeds they have who are good at show jumping are either currently stuck in Generation 1 or 1.5, and the Hanoverians are Generation 2. I mean, I guess we could use the Gen 3 Arabians. Bad planning on their part. They aren't new and shiny, and the Pasofino is yet another dressage horse and was coming out in May, after the festival. Bad timing there. Oh, wait, well, not really. Accidental early release for an hour. Yes. Most of our new Generation 3 horses are actually Iberian-style dressage horses with absolutely no dressage in the game. 
if you are as confused as I am, I have a Discord. For a game that focuses mainly on cross-country and show jumping, there is a very distinct lack of cross-country and show jumping horses being remade for Generation 3. And most of the Generation 1 and 1.5 show jumping horses, like the Oldenburg or the Westphalian or the Dutch Warmblood or the Cell Francais, never got a Generation 2 release. You can use an Arabian, which we've got three generations for in the game, the Hanoverian, and the Trachner, and the Thoroughbred are either Gen 2 or, if we are lucky, Gen 3, but the animations are broken releases. You can use the Quarter Horse, but the Quarter Horse in the game are definitely animated for Western riding. And the last time the Holsteiner was available was in Autumn Riders, so it's never been an SSO. And that's just show jumping. Most cross-country horses are thoroughbreds or crossbreeds of them with country warm blood as their name, like the Danish warm blood, the Swedish warm blood, also known as the Einsiedler, or even things like the Sel Italiano. I mean, if there is a country in general, they have their own variation of warm blood. The Americans call ours Morgans, to be fair. But just to the north of us, Canada has their own Canadian warm blood. So let's just say, I think the breeds they've been putting out or remaking may be really popular dressage breeds for the most part. The festival as given doesn't fit those breeds, and the festival as given doesn't really celebrate equestrianism at all. So masses and masses of confusion from this author. Breton, or Game Master B, they go over their process in the article, Discovery, Develop, and Polish Bug Fix Release. They gathered a bunch of ideas from in the studio and from the players, I guess, which um, in the Embassy Discord server, they had one of the ambassadors run a questionnaire feedback type survey about what, what players liked from past events, nothing but they what they wanted to see in new events, which didn't get a great deal of responses that were coherent or consistent and would require a lot of data collating. And then later Stacy came in and asked about what new horse colors do you want and got hundreds of responses, which was overwhelming because so many pictures. And they did ask for stuff in a blog post a month in advance. Not a lot of time for implementation there. Surveys with multiple choice answers. Save yourself some work. But if they had thousands of ideas, they didn't use any of them. The main issues here to me was A, time, and B, them wanting to use the bean. I don't think they gave themselves enough time to do this. I really don't. They had enough to get the decorations done and rearrange everything and get some new gear, but not enough time to really turn it into an event they needed to do. Then Sabine. She's just been finished. So using her means whatever plans they had had to be scrapped and new plans featuring Sabine implemented, which doesn't give them time for fleshing out ideas writing said ideas, or the most important part, editing said ideas. <laughs> this whole Sabine might be sabotaging the festival thing felt really childish for Sabine. I mean, not only is it old, given how much vandalism the Dark Riders have already done, but you know, snipping balloons and leaving trash and nothing here was even resolved. Then on the Instagram, they hired a comic creator, full-time job, to create this you know, actually really cute comic of a character checking out the festival and getting into the story between the bobcats and the bulldogs and choosing your riding club. The comic was hysterical. The layout for the festival was awesome in the comic. That should have been in the game. And then we should have resolved if it was Sabine and company doing the sabotage, or was it the Bulldogs and the Bobcats and the unnamed and unseen Jorvik Stables Riding Club going at it, or was it someone like Sonya of the Flying Foxes being puckish to see what she could get away with? The story as presented didn't have a beginning, middle, or end, which left it feeling really unsatisfying. The ending of the comic was cute and relatively predictable, but you know, I was entertained enough to say, okay, you're fine. It did have a beginning, middle, and end for the conflict presented for that character, so I was happy with it. Please, put this comic writer in charge of writing some story for the game. 
on a limited sample here, they know what they're doing. The story in the game didn't feel big. It felt rushed. It felt childish, even for a kid's game. And nothing felt really Jorvik. Putting up a booth about druids doesn't make the festival about Jorvik. I don't think they have a culture in mind for Jorvik to really tailor their festivals to. Without this world building of a culture, this is what is going to happen. We're going to get really generic and bland festivities. And according to the article, this bit of the festival was supposed to be about Baroque dressage. <laughs> really? <laughs> For Baroque dressage being so important to Jorvik's stables, this is the very first time we've heard of it. Not good to have a festival area about dressage, and then the only events were show jumping and cross country. Okay then. In, by the way, in Starshine Legacy, everyone was riding out of Jorvik stables. It is an inventing stable. It did everything. But hey, if you want to make this area about dressage, put some dressage events I can earn some experience from in it. I mean, Jorvik Stables' riding arena is shut up because Herman's great aunt, or whoever it was, went missing inside of it and it's supposedly haunted. Which is just an excuse not to put an interior in that building. I mean, I'm getting really, really tired of empty and haunted areas. Jorvik Stables Riding Arena, Fort Maria, and Castle Marching Guest are all supposedly empty and haunted. This doesn't make the game exciting, it makes it empty. Then they included the Red String Trail Ride out in Fir Grove, which didn't feel like it tied into anything at all. Honestly, in my opinion, the Red String Trail Ride is one of the best things they've got going for them and it's still boring. With a few tweaks, it could be really interesting. I mean, twice the amount of instances that we've gotten out on the trail. Less of them being trees falling down, rock slides, rabid rolls, and things falling from the sky. More squirrel messages, UFOs, very Pandoria stuff, and meeting people. And then, once you get up to the top of the trail, put up the string, then you continue the trail by turning it into a circle by using the mountain to get back down to the fire pit. I mean, you can use part of the Fur Grove Pass trail because you've got 99% of a trail down to it already. You can go around the championship and use part of the road. It's okay to do that and put more instances on that part of the trail. So the trail ride ends back where you started and is entertaining. The championships were just there. There was no story attached to them to make them fit into the festival. I ignored them the entire time because I just don't have that time or energy or investment. I don't care. Outside of the decorations, nothing felt like it tied together. Why are we celebrating equestrianism in the spring? I don't know. We just are. The story doesn't explain it. There's no emotional hook or investment for the player. We just get on and do stuff for the sake of doing it because it's there. And with the comic story not even being in the game, the whole Soul Rider versus the Bean thing didn't even make any sense. I can be all for multi-channel storytelling. If the story presented in the game makes sense without the other storytelling channel. It doesn't, so I'm against it right now. And about the cutscene nest promo. They like to really hype up commonplace things. I mean, okay, I can understand if this is a person who did the cutscene for Sabine is or was new to game development. I can understand being excited if nothing you've ever done has been used in promo materials before. I don't want to diminish this achievement. Good for you. Congrats! I am happy for you. At the same time, while the cutscene was nice and better animated than usual, it is pretty commonplace type of cutscene. This is normal in other games. I'm not even sure if this interaction was worth a cutscene. If they think this is great, then they need to play other games with fully rendered cutscenes and up their standards. This is good for SSO. This is downright mediocre and not even worth the time for other big games. 
let's raise the bar here. Come on. I'm glad they found some of the bugs. They make it sound like they have a test server now. Great! Please, announce us. But how they missed how bad the camera was with the balloons, I have no idea. And the early release of the Pasifino, that was glorious. Come on, folks. And here they are again, soliciting ideas at the end of this section of the article. I swear, if they had ideas, they'd be going, next year, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Stay tuned. Instead of trying to ask what we want, there seems to be a lack of vision. It doesn't matter to me if they say, we gathered thousands of ideas, if everything I see is rehashed stuff without an original idea in sight and them asking for more ideas. You can have too many ideas. That is possible. At some point, you have to focus and go, this is what we're doing. And I'm very concerned that they want to move to another area of the map, which would be for paying writers only, when they haven't actually done anything new or fleshed out the one writing discipline they claim, Baroque Dressage, they want the festival to be about. Let's just say, when I said they had nothing, I didn't expect to be quite this correct. As nice as the Sabine stuff was, it didn't really feel like much. It felt like the beginning of an idea that needed another week or two of development, fleshing out, and editing, and a middle and ending given. No, I don't want to wait until next year for an end to who is sabotaging the festival. That's dumb. And I'm not sure why they're introducing Sabine in a limited time event. They never seem to think of the new players in the next 11 months who are going to get through the story rapidly, and now they have to wait until the next spring festival to meet Sabine. It's a constant lack of planning as they get so excited to show off what they've completed that is shiny and new right this minute! So now... In the main story quest lines, they're going to have to work yet another big cinematic cutscene of Sabine into the story for the players who didn't get to play the Spring Festival event. Will they think of this? Probably not. Doing two hooks is doing twice the work as needed. But this is SSO in a nutshell. Let's move on. Ismael is back. This time Ismael does a much better job of not using technical jargon in this article. Thank you, Ismael. So the progress report here is they've actually have started to use what they're calling refactoring in the game servers. So if you can't log in, if you are seeing broken textures, if you're noticing animations being wonky, if you are seeing things load in incorrectly, or your stable or inventory is losing items or going all black with certain functions, it's the database refactoring. Okay, I'm going to try to go over again this real quick because it has been a couple of months and he actually gives some good pictures this time. What Star Stable is doing is they are taking all the information they have in the servers, okay? They had all this information stored in one big lump. I used brains as an example last time. They had it in one document or one application. I don't know what is going to make this clear in your mind. What they are doing now is they are taking sections of that information and they are putting it into new documents or applications and they are using the code in the main server to send different information to your computer at different times and only when needed. This is the part of back-end optimization, and most games have been doing this for a good five to ten years. What was happening was when your computer was asking for information from the server, say about logging in, it had to go through one huge document to find it, which slowed it down. Too many people asking for information at the same time slows it down even more. This is how we get lag. This is how we can't log in. I can't even get this game to run about about 40 FPS and high-end graphics. So it's not running well to begin with. Now, they've been breaking these batches of information up into smaller documents. That means all the login information, it's in its own document. It's in its own, you know, application. 
It's a lot faster, and different players will be accessing different parts of, you know, these different documents at different times. So, you know, you'll have players logging in and accessing that document. You'll have players doing races and uh, accessing that document. You'll have players doing, you know, wanting to go into their inventory and accessing that document. So it puts less strain on the computers hosting the information and speeds things up. However, when they break this information up, they have to write new code for the engine and the game to be able to access this information. It's kind of like, um, okay, it's an old DOS code string. The closest you're going to be able to see it is when you go searching for documents on your computer. So, you know, C, user info, star stable online, blah, blah, blah. So they, they're changing up where it's stored. So they have to change that string so the computer knows where to find it. You know, they have to make a new shortcut. Okay. So sometimes when they split it up, not everything gets moved correctly or in a timely fashion. Or the code isn't finished or written properly. They don't get the right shortcut. So we get bugs in the game. Black voids, plain brown tree trunks, losing the skybox, losing water, etc. and so forth. Now, it does sound like they do have at least one test server, but if it is testing everything, every single update every week, bugs are still going to slip through due to how many different types of systems they're trying to cater their game to. This whole breaking up the information process is going to help the game run better some. Not a lot. Some. The main issue with the game is PX Engine. PX Engine is 15 to 18 years old. It needs a significant update, or SSO needs to be migrated to a new engine with these multiple databases and rewriting of the code from top to bottom, as most of the assets and now the new animations could be just dropped into a new engine because they are using more standard programs, by which they mean Maya. The reason why this is not going to happen is because putting the game into a new engine and redoing their main assets into the new style will take everybody on the team, which we don't know how many that is, but I'm going to say 50 is reaching, I guess. And I say that because according to Glassdoor, apparently the HR and marketing teams are much bigger than the development teams. And some assumptions gives me 45 people maybe working on each of the three games. Oops. 45 people per team over, you know, so 130 odd people working developers versus 100 people working HR and marketing. I want to be wrong on this one. It would take everyone on the team anywhere from six months to two years working full time. No fun Fridays to move it over. So no more horse releases. No more weekly updates. No progress for six months to two years, depending on how good they are at development and how many problems they'd run into with a new engine. It would make more sense to hire a 50-person team to remaster the game into a new engine, but they'd rather do something else instead, and we'll get there. So, if they optimize the game to fix the information information, issues and do a proper load on distance for their assets so I stop seeing them shift from bad to good and pop in all the time and fix all the UV layers and textures and get rid of the duplicate coding in their game then okay it will be a pretty decent band-aid but that's all it is it's a band-aid they are nursing this on fire 15 to 18 year old engine for as long as they can at some point it's not going to be able to do what they need it to do. They've already said they've run into, oh, it's not going to do what we want for the Hollow Woods. Be aware, this is a band-aid. And it's a band-aid that can go horribly wrong and cause the servers to crash and we lose service to the game until they figure out why. And this will happen at the worst times when they have these recycled free Star Rider codes out. I wouldn't be investing any money to buy horses or star coins in this game unless they suddenly announce we have a new game engine because it could go down at any time. Stacy 
and spends her part of the article explaining and justifying why they need to take the old horses out in favor of the new horses. The old horses have old code done in outdated C++ and were made in 3D Studio Max, which is put out by the same company that does Maya. But they've been pushing Maya for years over 3D Studio Max. So basically, the old horses are no longer compatible with the current game code, and they don't match the current game style, and they have an animation system that no one currently working at the company knows how to work with. But hey, given 90% of their Gen 3 horses animated since 2018 are also broken, it doesn't seem they know how to work their new standard animation system either. Go figure. You know, it would make more sense if when they were doing the new generations of horses that those old generations left within one or two weeks of the new generation and we got a trade function to turn them in to get the newer horses. But SSO, at the time, saw this as a profit opportunity and kept them in the game, lowering their prices, because kids don't know the difference between a Generation 1 Arabian, a Generation 2, or a Generation 3 Arabian. They just see the Gen 1 is cheaper, and then they get it, and the new tech doesn't fit on it, they're disappointed, they sell the Gen 1 horse and feel like they've wasted their money. Yes, this has happened. SSO does not put enough information in their game in easily found ways, or at all, for players to know the difference between the different generation horses and what horse can and can't wear the current tech. The new buying system will help this a little bit, but not a lot. This is on them. This is predatory. They need to fix it. Don't sell your Gen 1 if you buy them, just put them in your pasture. You don't have a max pasture limit. Getting 2,000 Jorvik shillings back isn't worth it. Just put it in your pasture, you own a piece of SSO history. The horses, because they don't have standard animations or hairstyles or even rigging, especially the older ones, they take up a lot of space and resources on the computer. The more animations and such you have, the more space it takes. So yes, these horses are going to have to be removed from the game eventually just to free up space so they can sell more Generation 3 horses. Yes, I'm cynical. You know, they could expand the map, but that seems stalled. Best case scenario would be to remake all the old coats in the third gen style and institute a trade system for the old horses to the new horses. But will they do it? Probably not, because that won't actually make them money, even if it would make their customers happy. So yes, the old horses have to go. They aren't going to work in the game very well after they do. It's just the differences in space and technology from 15 years ago. Because the Gen 1s are star stable seasonal horses. And lastly, in this blog post, Marie Cecil gives us an update on the player character. So they've decided to do 12 skin tones, which is the exact number of skin tones and faces they have right now. The range of skin tones they're showing now is more diverse and much better colorations. Because, let's face it, the older, darker POC skin tones look muddy and flat and too red, and the aging themed skin tones look jaundiced. You don't see, or I don't see, a lot of players using them because they're just plain bad or racist. Those skin tones and feature shapes go all the way back to the Star Stable seasonal writer games, and was one of the things they imported directly into the online version of the game without any changes. Like they imported a lot of the horses once they started selling them in 2013 without any changes. Funny, you could buy the horses in the Star Stable seasonal games for in-game currency. Hmm. Textures, musics, assets, it was a real asset flip online game before asset flips were a thing. Well, let's be clear though, even for 2005, the SSO skin tones are really, really bad. These new ones look a lot better. We have gone from really, really bad to Guild Wars 1 quality skin tones. So, I mean, they're still at 2005 level of graphics here, but at least they look good. And 12 skin tones means they won't have to change the size of the database from what they have. Less work for them. Now, the next issue is faces and heads. 
SSO's makeup system is a single layer system that is semi-transparent and uses these things called masks to block out certain areas of the model to lay down color in one go across eyes, lips, and cheeks. Now let's go to the SSO database because she has a really good explanation photo there. So the makeup has eyeshadow, an under eye color, mascara and or liner, blush, and lipstick. All of this is one layer. And some of these have been broken since they redid the character, mostly by shortening up the mech, the last time. I don't know if you've noticed, but you can go in and try some of these makeups, and they're going to make your face look white. My character is on the second lightest skin tone there is, and will make her look white. Not skin tone white, white white, as in a piece of paper. This is why most of the face options available just have different nose shapes and lip shapes. The nose doesn't change anything, and they can just expand the color of the lip a little bit with coating. Now they're saying they want to give us eye shapes, and as you can see in the picture, this is going to present a problem in trying to use one makeup mesh for different eye shapes, depending on if they are upturned, downturned, round, element, deep set, prominent, and so on. Looking at the picture, they were doing five different makeup types on two different eye shapes. Well, two is twice the number we have now, so I guess that's improvement. The real question, and the one they are answering is, is the makeup going to remain on that single color layer? Or when the new player character comes, is everything in our closet that we paid star coins, aka real money towards, now trash? Inquiring minds want to know, but this is going very slowly, but it seems to be proceeding. Now for the news. So instead of hiring new game developers to fix their game and make it a game, what are they doing instead? They are hiring marketers and brand developers. They are going into licensing. Ten years after launching their online game, Star Stable is finally getting into toys. We've had the rare school supplies. We had expensive bracelets. We had books. And now Star Stable has finally gotten rid of the program and licensed out its property to Just Play. Licensing means Just Play has bought the rights to make toys based off the Star Stable character and horses. Money is flowing to Star Stable, and Star Stable Entertainment will get a cut of the profits, if any, from Just Play when the toys are sold. Star Stable is not in control of the manufacturing or the warehouses. They aren't in control of where the merchandise will be in stores, will be really. They aren't necessarily even in control of prices. They can say, we like this line of toys you do, make it in a line like that. They can try to set stuff out in the contract for price range and where they want to see them, but it's going to depend heavily on what Reach Just Play already has, and if the buyers of the big box stores on their sales list see Star Stable as a viable product to push and rent shelves to. Yes, they rent shelves. So let's take a look at Just Play products. Just Play makes toys for Disney, Netflix, DreamWorks, Mattel, and Hasbro. They do big, over 20-inch Barbie dolls, and they also do the big plastic styling heads with the hair. They have merchandise for Spirit Untamed, and they have merchandise for My Little Pony. And they have Shimmer Corns in Rinner's Stable. So the Shimmercorns were a 2021 Napa Award winner, just like the Star Stable books were a 2020 Napa Award winner. You might be seeing a theme here. Remember, they had to submit their stuff to Napa. Napa didn't just choose them out of a hat. Just Play Toys retail for solid plastic horses at $7 at Walmart to collector horse and doll sets at $25 for Kohl's in Target. We don't know what type of toys they're going to have, but if past is indicative of future, I'm going to presume the 20 to 25 price range for a doll and horse set is going to be the target. You're going to find these on Amazon, in the middle and upper budget department stores. Okay, what do I mean by that? Walmart are your base 
budget department stores. Think Family Dollar or Dollar General. Ross Dress for Less, Bell's Outlet. Outlet stores are a good example here. Huge amounts of inventory bought to be sold at the cheapest price possible. Five to seven bucks for a doll. Pretty normal. Target those steps at the price to the $12 to $15 range for a doll. There are middle budget department store. Because Target wants to be a little more highbrow than Walmart, Target, they'll carry the higher and more expensive toys. Belks is a good one. Bells, Dillard's, then you have Kohl's. Kohl's is what you get right before you start heading into the mall type stores. They're roughly the same level as a JCPenney and a Sears. Except Kohl's, for the most part, manufactures everything in their store. Kohl's has a very tiny toy section, and the tiny toy section has some really nice and really good quality toys, which is where Just Play comes in because I have seen these Mattel Barbie hair styling heads at Kohl's. So SSE is doing toys. These toys haven't even hit product development stage. They want our input on that. Which is ridiculous. Come on, you can make a toy without our input. You have eight characters and eight horses and lots of other horses you can use. You don't need our help here. I'm going to say optimistically then, December 2023 in time for the holiday season. I mean, they're calling the game hugely successful. Which I guess if you look at money, that's true. If you look at the actual game, 10 years in, with actual player numbers, not so much. I'd be wary of having these higher priced dolls. With inflation going up and global supply chain problems, I'd definitely be thinking on the lower end. These dolls are going to be solid-ish type dolls if any of the products are to go by. They won't be ball joint dolls. They won't be that articulated. The 5 inch spirit on tame dolls have joints in the legs so they can stand and sit on the horse. The arms are bent and look like they go up and down, and that's it. And the 7 inch horses are plastic, probably blown ones like Briar with acrylic or nylon hair. And for this, they're charging $20 to $25. Kids will probably like them. Collectors, maybe not so much. The horse molds and material and packaging and the size is going to be the big expense, not the dolls. It just works out that way. And it will really depend on if they end up in Walmart or Target shelves, too. How easy can players get a hold of these worldwide? Because they aren't even telling us what markets these dolls are going to be sold in. That's a huge thing. If they're only available in Europe or the US, that's an entirely different set of numbers. This feels like five years too late to me. It needs to be done. And I know they're doing it now because they had the character redesigns done, including the player character. This should have been a push or incentive to get those character designs done that much faster, you know, five years ago when they started talking about it. So. Here we are, another month gone, and I'm not seeing a great deal to show for. They're begging us for ideas again for events, when players want map and story. And they're announcing toys, which would take effort from their too large marketing and branding department, instead of funneling resources into their games to make content so they can retain players to sell those books and toys too. Just very weird set of priorities. So, thanks for listening. <laughs> Take care of yourselves. We'll see what happens in the next month. Just stay safe, bless, and I'll see you in the next video.